Top of the prize morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Prize Fest 2020. This is the Golden Fork Demo Kitchen, and we are going to be doing a free kitchen demo today for breakfast. But before we get there, I just want to let you know that Prize Fest is just getting started. So get over to prizefest.com. You can buy your passes for the films. You can buy your passes for the music prize. You can buy your passes for fashion prize. You can even buy more things that are out there, including t-shirts and loot crates and all those cool things we've got there. But your time is now. So please be a part of Prize Fest 2020, the biggest, boldest, bodiest music, film, fashion, and food festival on the planet. So without further ado, you're all ready for brunch. We're ready for brunch. So we're gonna bring up one of the brightest spirits out there, the doyen of the food prize. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Melissa Brannon. Hey everybody, thank you so much, Gregory. Super appreciate it and I am thrilled to be here. Just gonna boop, set that aside. Uh, I hope y'all are all here ready to rise and prize from 10 a.m. risers. Good on you. Uh, before we begin, I just wanna let y'all know, this is a do-ahead brunch. So you can cook it all the way through right now, or you can do some of the do-ahead steps and then make this brunch whenever you are up for it. It's all about you, friends. And today I'm super excited to show you three delicious things that are gonna be like amazing to have in your brunch arsenal, all right? First, we're gonna do a crustless quiche Lorraine. We're also gonna do a sweet and spicy candied bacon. I mean, who doesn't love bacon, right? And lastly, we're gonna make a grapefruit thyme mimosa. And what's amazing about this menu is it's super versatile. You can do some of it ahead. You can substitute other things that you like. And I promise it will not disappoint. So look around your kitchen. Do you have your equipment? Do you have all the ingredients you need? Awesome, let's get ready to do this. So. The first thing we're gonna do is make our candied bacon. Super easy. I hope you all have your ovens already at 350. All right, if you don't, it's no big deal. This is do ahead, right? You got some time. So we're gonna need our sugar mixture. And all I have in here is about a cup of light brown sugar. You can use dark brown if you like. We're gonna add three little hits of heat. First, black pepper. And I normally add eh, about a teaspoon or so. And here's the thing, this is gonna have a little kick to it. So if you're a person that's like, I don't like that spicy, don't sweat it. Just go easy, maybe do a half teaspoon, all right? I kinda eyeball it, if it's a little bit more, if it's a little bit less, it, it'll be okay. All right, next up, woo! I got red chili flakes. So uh, about a half teaspoon, again, I'm eyeballing, it'll be all right. And last but not least, a little cayenne pepper. So cayenne, I like the heat. I'm a big fan of sweet and heat. So I'm gonna put a whole teaspoon. But again, if you don't like that much spice, pull it back, do a half teaspoon, or just do black pepper and chili flakes. It'll be cool. I'm gonna use my hands and I'm just gonna kind of, you know, mix this up. I wanna get those spices distributed. And you can see here, what you don't want to happen is to have all your teaspoon of cayenne in one little place and you take that bite of bacon and your mouth falls up, like off, right? So anyway, again, just a quick little mix to make sure all those heat and spices are well distributed. Next up, I got my bacon. Now, normally I'm like bacon, bacon, I mean, I guess a little bit, but for this, you definitely want a thicker slice of bacon. If you use something kind of thinner, it might go a little too quickly on you and you want that sugar to brown in the oven. So I found this nice thick sliced bacon, right? And I mean, really y'all, it's just lining as many pieces as you can get on a pan. I tend to put foil down only because here's what's about to happen. We're gonna have bacon grease everywhere. I mean, it's delicious, but it'll be everywhere. We're gonna have sugar that's gonna caramelize in this pan. So, 
you know, if you do it right in the pan, it's really no problem, but it is gonna be a little bit of a mess. And so for me, it's just one way to make cleanup a little bit easier. I am a big fan of this dish. What I love about it is if you have just a teeny bit of restraint, you have this incredible candy bacon that you can chop up after the fact and also throw in like salads or, you know, just have a snack is also fine. I'm gonna squeeze one more piece on there. This is probably right about a pound. This is a one and a half pound package. So if you got a pound of bacon, you're good, all right? But again, you wanna make sure it's in one flat single layer, okay? So next up, I got that simple sugar mixture we made and all we're gonna do, sprinkle it over the top, all right? And the thing is, you wanna make sure everything gets covered. So I'm gonna start by just kinda sprinkling, sprinkling. And then once it's all on there, I use my hands. I'm just gonna kinda slide it across. I'll pack it a little bit. And again, trying to get as much of that bacon covered. Now, I have seen sometimes where people, they'll take it to here, flip over the bacon and put more sugar on. To me, that just feels like a little bit more work than is necessary. And trust me, this is gonna be enough to get you where you need to go, all right? I mean, we're just gonna finish that. Now, if for some reason you feel like you do not have enough sugar and spices on your bacon, just get another half cup, quarter cup of brown sugar, add, you know, pinch of, pinch of pepper, pinch of cayenne, and throw it on. All right, so here's what we got, guys. You see, most of the bacon's covered. We're in a nice flat line, and now I'm gonna throw this in my 350 oven, okay? So, here we go. Okay, so we've got our bacon in the oven. It's at 350, as I said, about hmm, 25, 30 minutes, and you'll be golden, all right? So we're gonna let that hang out, and we're gonna get started on all the ingredients we're gonna need for our quiche, right? So first of all, I've got some onions. I mean, we're just gonna slice these and caramelize. And actually, you know, while I'm thinking about it, I'm gonna go ahead woo, and get my pan warming up. And I'm gonna go ahead and even throw a little oil in there, okay? So while our pan's warming, we're gonna cut our onions. So to slice onions, I'm gonna take off the top part and the bottom part, right? Now you got this nice flat surface. You can let that be nice and flat, it gives you some stability. We're gonna cut it right in half and it makes it super easy to take that peel off, right? All right, so I'm gonna show y'all how I love to slice an onion maybe a little bit different than you've seen. So the first thing I do is I'll take off, see about like a half inch or so, right? I will take it and put it flat and just slice across. And the reason is you don't really need to have all that, people try and kind of make all those little teeny tiny wedges across. Don't worry about that. We're gonna just go straight up and down, all right? So one, just slicing across. When I get about here and it becomes a little bit wobbly, I go ahead and just let it flip over again. You have a nice flat surface again, which gives you that stability, and you just slide right through it, right? There we go. All right, so again, take off that little chunk, put it on its flat side, slice right through it, and then I'll just get these little guys going. And when it gets to the point where it starts getting a little wobbly, I'll just flip it on its flat side and keep going. And look at that, you guys. A pan is probably just about ready to throw these onions in. And what I'm looking for, still a little bit cool, but I'm looking for that oil to kind of slide right across the pan, right? That's when you can tell it's kind of warmed up. Now for caramelized onions, we don't need this pan to be smoking, smoking, smoking hot. Uh, we don't want to burn them, we want to caramelize them. So you want your pan kind of a medium heat where you can kind of let these onions slowly cook. It's going to caramelize the natural sugars in them. We're going to transform these. I think, you know, that's good. Just a little baby sizzle. We don't need to go crazy, all right? I'm going to do one onion, which is plenty for your quiche, but pro tip. A lot of times when I'm caramelizing onions, I'll go ahead and do a second one just because it's always great to have caramelized onions around the house. They're delicious. They add so much. You can put them in your salads. You can put them on sandwiches or burgers. 
I don't know, put them in egg dishes like today, or quiche, right? And that's it. So with my onions, we've got oil in there. I'm just gonna give these, woo, woo lost one, that's all right. A little quick toss, so they're all covered in oil, right? Some salt and some pepper. And we're just gonna let these go. They shouldn't, you know, think about caramelized onions, it takes a little bit time. So these will probably wanna give them about 10 to 15 minutes. And as they cook, we'll prep the rest of our ingredients. All right, so next up. I got a little ham steak, right? So these are just a, a boneless ham steak, which you can find at the grocery store. If you don't see them around, you can also go to the deli counter, find your favorite ham that you like to cook, that you like to make sandwiches with or what have you, and just tell them, hey, give me a nice like quarter inch thick slice of ham. And a couple of those are gonna be perfect for you, right? All I'm doing on this is just a really simple dice. So I'm just gonna, it doesn't have to be perfect. And another thing is, you know, let's say you're a vegetarian, leave out the ham. Or let's say you got really fancy and you have some incredible sausage at your house that you've been like dying to use, brown off your sausage in a pan and use that instead of the ham. It's really not a big deal. All right, so I'm just gonna again, give these a nice little dice, right? I mean, we're just gonna go to pork land today. We may as well go strong. I'm gonna cut both of them, I already got it. If it looks like too much, I'll save it. I don't know, throw it in something else. But for today, let's go with it, all right? All right, so here we go. Got my ham. Now you know what, I'll just throw that right back on this plate. All right, there we go. And you can set that aside, all right? Look at that, we've already got one component done. I'm just gonna give these a little flip. Just let them keep cooking, all right? Next up, we're gonna need a little bit of cheese, right? So today, I'm gonna go with a little bit of cave-aged Gruyere. If you've never had Gruyere before, uh, it's a Swiss cheese, so really similar in flavor to Swiss, but here's the point where I'm gonna say, if you're gonna do Gruyere, do yourself a favor, find the cave aged Gruyere. It's gonna be a little bit stinkier, a little bit nuttier. The flavor is so much more intense and pronounced than just a standard Gruyere. So if you can find it, get it, use it, you'll thank me later, right? And again, just like with our ham, if you are like feeling a different cheese, I'm not at your house. If you wanna grate that big old block of cheddar you've had hanging out, go for it, right? All I wanna tell you is for the Gruyere, Make sure you cut off the waxy part, right? You're gonna need about six ounces of cheese. So you follow your bliss. Just gonna grate this, you know, do, do, do. I try and sometimes give this job to my kids. Um, it does not always go as well as I think, uh, but you know, maybe you have a really great sous chef there who will help you with the grating. And if you wanna be a total cheat, there's no judgment if you buy the pre-shredded cheese, but I am gonna tell you, if you grate your own, the quality is a lot better, all right? Again, I'm not there, we'll be good, okay? So, let's throw this in a bowl, all right? We are just rocking and rolling along, all right? Set aside. Okay, I'm gonna check all my onions again. Let's give these a little, a little stir. We're getting there. I mean, we're starting to get some color, you know? And again, these just take a while. But it also shows you how quick and easy this dish is. All right, so next up, well, I'll tell you. Next up, I'm gonna wipe this down just a bit. All right. So now we're gonna make the base for our quiche, right? So you probably had a quiche that are real traditional, pie crust, all that good stuff, right? This is gonna be a crustless quiche. So it's almost a savory version of this French dessert called clafoutis. And clafoutis, you see it in like all the traditional French recipes, cookbooks, typically with cherries, but it's the sweet, eggy, custardy deliciousness, right? 
we're gonna take that and we're gonna turn it into like a savory creation. And again, what I love about this dish is all of these components are really do ahead. Uh, and once you've made that base, you can set it aside, build it on whatever day you want, and you'll be ready to go. You'll be a superstar and you won't have that much work, right? So again, we're just kind of checking these. My heat may be a little higher. I'm trying to kind of zhuzh these along, right? But just letting them kind of go. Turn it down just a, sm a smidge. If you start feeling like your onions are getting maybe a little bit burned, turn your heat down. You can always add a little bit of water and that'll help create some steam and have them keep going again, all right? So back to our friend, our egg base, right? So I've got a couple of things. Just gonna move over, all right? All right, deceptively simple. Well, it's not deceptively simple. It in fact is very simple. So first thing I have is about a quarter cup of cornstarch. I'm just gonna throw that in my bowl. I know what you're probably thinking, why cornstarch, right? It's an interesting ingredient, maybe something you wouldn't expect to find in quiche. So this cornstarch is gonna do a couple things. Uh, first, it's gonna help hold uh, your hold your quiche together, it kind of acts as like a binder, but also it's gonna give it a lightness. So sometimes you have those quiches that can be a little bit dense. This is gonna be really light, um, really luscious, all right? You could, if you don't have cornstarch, you could in a pinch use flour. Uh, it certainly won't hurt. However, it changes the texture a little bit. It won't be as light, as delicate um, as it would be with the cornstarch, but again, if you don't have cornstarch on hand, use a quarter cup of flour and you'll be just fine. So I've got my quarter cup of cornstarch and right here I have about a, quarter, a cup and a quarter of whole milk. All right, I'm only gonna add about half. And I'm doing it left-handed, which a little bit weird, but totally works. All right, so all I'm doing right now is I'm incorporating that cornstarch into the milk. Okay, so you can see I don't have any clumps. What you don't want is a big blob of cornstarch in the middle of your beautiful quiche, yeah? Then I'm gonna add my eggs. So I'm gonna add four whole eggs and two yolks. Why four egg, whole eggs and two yolks? Well, that's kind of the ratio I've found. You know, you want proteins from the egg whites in this dish, because that's gonna give you a little bit of that stability and structure. However, you want those egg yolks, because those are gonna be super rich and add that really luscious character. All right, I've got my four whole eggs. I'm gonna do a couple of egg yolks. So some folks try and do the little back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You can do that, right? I um, tend to just kind of crack it in a bowl and use my hands to pull it out. I just feel like I tend to go a lot faster just to do this. All right, now the caveat is, maybe it's not that fast. <laughs> so it feels like it when you've got about like 10 to do. Here we go, let go. If you have a little egg white in there, it's totally no problem, right? Because you already have egg whites in there, so no worries. I'm gonna give my hands a quick rinse. Okay, while I'm here, before I go any further, again, just checking on my onions and give them a little stir. I'm gonna keep letting these babies cook, right? And I think what I may do, is just give them a little more touch of oil. All right. Okay, so we're coming back to our egg base. So at this point, I've got the cornstarch, I've got half the milk, I've got some eggs, four whole, two yolk. I'm just gonna start whisking. And all I'm doing right now is trying to incorporate these eggs into the dish. I don't wanna see any big streaks of yolk. I don't wanna see a big blob of egg white, all right? I'm gonna go ahead, whoop, here are my friends over here. Hey, back to our friend Cayenne. About a teaspoon of salt. Okay, and then pinch of cayenne. So I'm gonna 
one time I just decided that for a pinch, I just kind of hit it like that and um, the entire jar fell in. So try to go on my hand from now on. All right, so giving this again, a little stir. And last but not least, we're gonna add the rest of that milk. And then, because we deserve it, a cup of heavy cream. And that cream, that cornstarch is really what's gonna make this, that super luscious, amazing quiche, all right? So at this point, your quiche base is done. So for me, if I'm doing this ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and put this, I, you can put it in a deli cup container, you can put it in some sort of Tupperware, but at this point, you can set this aside, put it in your fridge, and it's good until you're ready to use it. And by good, I would say use it within a couple of days, right? I mean, don't leave this in your fridge for four weeks. It's not that far of a do ahead, okay? So I'm gonna set this over here though, for now. All right, so just a reminder, I know you're probably right next to your stove, but you're gonna wanna keep checking your onions. So give them a little stir, then like leave them be. Give them a little stir, leave them be. Again, you know, for caramelized onions, depending on how hot or how high a flame, you're gonna probably be a good um, 15 minutes or so. So just let them go, try and be patient. Sometimes I wash a dish or two just so I'm distracted and I don't like frenetically check on these bad boys. Okay, so in a perfect world, right? these onions will be done. But you and I are just moving a little faster than we thought today. So I'm gonna use another pan to go ahead and wilt some spinach and let these bad boys keep going. Here's the thing though, if you're doing this at home, maybe you're going a little slower or maybe you have caramelized onions already in your fridge because you're in the know, just use the same pan. It's certainly not gonna hurt. But again, we're gonna keep this train rolling. So I've got another pan right here. I'm gonna get this pan going nice and hot. And today I have some baby spinach that I'm gonna wilt. Again, this is not something that you have to put in. I mean, if you are afraid of green things, that's all right, don't include it. But I love to find ways to include just a little bit of vegetable. It makes me feel better when I'm being really decadent and eating eggs, cream, ham, cheese, uh, and of course, you know, a big pile of bacon, right? So I'm letting this pan get hot. All right, I'm gonna go ahead, it's been driving me crazy. I'm gonna go ahead and throw a little bit of canola oil in here, but you could use olive oil, whatever you have on hand, and just letting that heat up. Now for wilting my spinach, I'll go ahead and get this pretty hot. It doesn't have to be like a slow and low like our onions. Just look at that, they're finally starting to cooperate, right? All right, so. Letting this warm up. I'm super excited about this too. Like, I don't know what your kitchen is smelling like right now, but these onions, they have like just this really amazing smell, right? They get kind of sweet, kind of nutty. It's kind of like one of those smells that always makes me kind of be like, uh, what's about to happen here? It's like garlic and butter or like onions cooking down. I am just a big fan of like this goodness. All right. so. We're still gonna wait on this pan. All right, so we're here. We got our onions really quick. While I'm waiting for this pan to get a little bit warmer, we're gonna run over to the oven and just check on that bacon, okay? So here we go. All right, let's see. You wanna get in here for this goodness? Oh, yes, this is what I'm looking for. Oh, how nice is that, right? So you can see the fat starting to render out, the sugar is melting on top, but you can also see this bacon is still maybe a little bit underdone. So we're gonna let it keep heading on its way. We're gonna let it get a little bit more color. Okay, so here we are back. My oil is nice and hot for my spinach. I've got about half a pound here of baby spinach. Just gonna let it stew. Now here's the thing about spinach. Whoop, get out of there. Spinach has a lot of um, moisture in it. So even though it might seem a little bit too much for this pan, don't touch the bottom of the pan. It's gonna start wilting pretty quickly, right? So just gonna set that. And what I may do, 
give it a little tiny bit of a stir. If you have tongs, you can pick up your spinach and actually turn it over, all right? You don't need them. See, it's already wilting. I'm gonna go ahead, hit it with a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, right? And now that it's started to wilt, I'm gonna give it a little stir. You can see this really doesn't take too long and I'll go ahead and add the rest, all right? Okay, so I've added a little bit more spinach. I'm gonna add a little bit more salt and pepper. And we're just gonna let this finish cooking. And you can see too, those caramelized onions are just about there. So nice and golden brown. I mean, can you see this? Look at this. Woo! That's looking really good, y'all. All right, back to my spinach down here. Looking good and wilted. And keep turning it. As the spinach cooking, it's releasing a lot of moisture, and that moisture it releases actually helps steam and cook it. So we'll do spinach super fast. Now, if you are like one of those people, you can see we've got these little stems on our spinach, right? You can sit and pick them all off, but for me, it just seems a little bit overkill. It's baby spinach. So it's already gonna be pretty tender. And at this point, I mean, our spinach is really about there. You can see most of that spinach is cooked. It's softened. I say we just turn that heat off, all right? And also, I'm pretty good with where these onions are at this point. So I'm gonna turn the heat off of these as well, all right? Now, for the spinach, Here's one important part. As you can see, probably already see, feel that liquid hanging out down there, all right? It's not a big deal. But when you wilt spinach, you are gonna have some excess liquid. So what I like to do is I'll put the spinach in a bowl, press off some of that liquid, or even in the pan. Um, I'll show you guys in a bowl. I think it'll be easier to see, right? So. You could even, you know, if you have a sieve or a colander, you could pour it into there. Not necessary, not necessary, but again, sometimes I'll just take, take my spatula, just pour off that excess liquid. Yeah, and it's just like pressing. See how much is coming out of there? You don't wanna mess up your beautiful egg quiche base with all that extra liquid. So again, just squeezing that excess out, all right? So, at this point, I've got spinach, caramelized onions, I've got ham and cheese, and I've got my egg base. Right now, you could totally stop, right? You could pack up all your ingredients, separate them, and you could get everything in your fridge, and like your quiche is basically ready to go at this point. But I'm gonna show you what to do when you're ready to roll, okay? So, let me grab my baker. Okay, folks, you've done all your prep for your quiche. So at this point, all we have left to do is build it, right? Um, so this is basically a two, two and a half quart baker. And if you look on the bottom of your baking dishes, a lot of times it'll tell you the volume of it. Um, but if that's not the case, a nine by nine square pan is like perfect. It's right around that volume. You could do that. I'm not sure what the dimensions of this are. If I had to guess, I'd say maybe like a seven by 11. But again, you just wanna get around that vicinity. If you do something too big, like a 13 by nine, uh, your quiche is gonna be kind of skinny. You don't want that. You want a nice big fluffy quiche, all right? So to build your quiche, you can actually do this step ahead as well. However, I would recommend making sure all of your ingredients are cool before you put uh, in everything because you don't want your cheese melting to everything, all right? But that's all right. We're gonna just go for it, okay? So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna build a little bit of caramelized onions. I don't know that I even need all of these. Follow your bliss. If you want it super oniony, ooh, that's a little toasty. And that's also probably why you want it 
to cool a little, all right? But let's just pretend you were way ahead of the game and did ahead, all right? So we've got our caramelized onions. Then you've got your spinach, all right? And I'm just gonna kinda, making sure I distribute it well, right? I, you want a little bit of spinach, a little bit of caramelized onions, and a little bit of ham in every bite. Ooh, asbestos fingers, all right? Here we go, all right. And let's see, a little bit more right there. See, don't you feel healthier already? All right, and then we will add our ham, right? So as I said, one ham steak may have been enough, and if that's the case, no big deal. We will just save the rest of those ham cubes for something else. Make a mean mac and cheese with some ham, or make a quesadilla, or you know, scramble yourself an egg right now really fast, so if you're really hungry, you'll be waiting for it, all right? So there we go. Got our ham, and last but not least, our Gruyere cheese that we grated. I'm just gonna, I mean, I'm gonna say I'm kind of generous with the cheese because I love cheese and this cheese is one of my favorites. All right, at this point, you could wrap this in plastic. You could put that egg base into, um, again, some sort of Tupperware container and set it aside. And at that point, all you're gonna have to do is add your base and hit the oven. But I'm gonna go ahead and show you the rest of the way, right? So again, this is not rocket science, right? We have our dish ready to go, we have our egg base. Now, this is really important. If you are making your egg base ahead of time and you've had it in the fridge for a day or two, I want you to make sure that you look at the bottom of whatever container you have. Sometimes that cornstarch will kind of fall to the bottom. It's no big deal, but you wanna take a fork, kind of stir it up and make sure that cornstarch gets reincorporated into your base so that you don't lose that fluffy incorporation, right? You want that cornstarch distributed because that's what's gonna make everything kind of bind together and give you that really light, luscious deliciousness, okay? So here we go. I'm gonna give it a quick whisk just in case, all right? And then we are gonna pour this over. Oop. And at this point, ooh, our quiche is ready to go in the oven as well, right? So, really quickly, I'm gonna also check on that bacon, right? We've been, if you're at home, you're making that bacon, you're smelling it. So let's see how it's doing, okay? Here we go. All right, so again, ooh, yes. This, my friends, that is looking just about right. And you can tell everything's kind of rendered out. We're not getting too, too dark. Everything's kind of opaque, we're getting a nice color. If you are a person, if you are a person that likes your bacon a little bit darker, right? Like maybe you like kind of well done bacon, it's cool. Give it like another couple of minutes. For me, this is just kind of right spot on. So we're gonna go ahead and pull it, okay? Okay. So, I mean, now you can probably really get a gander on this. So again, see that caramelized, kind of the sugar is kind of caramelizing, bubbly. Our bacon's fully rendered. This is ready to go. So what I like to do, I have a sheet pan with a rack, right? While the bacon's still hot, I wanna um, go ahead and transfer it. And just let it kind of cool. And like, you'll see, it's kind of sticky. That's okay. I mean, it's got, right, like delicious sugar all over it. But if you let these kind of hang on a rack is when they kind of start to firm up. Now, let's say you're like, but I'm gonna have bacon on Tuesday. It's totally okay. You can make this bacon and then let it cool. And you're gonna just throw it in like some foil or or if you have a world's largest Tupperware, you could put this in there. I mean, like the real trick is like, will you like make it that long? But you can do this bacon ahead. And then as you get to the end of your quiche, you would just throw that bacon in there on a sheet pan, a little bit of foil, and let it just gently rewarm for like a couple minutes just to like take the chill off, right? So at this point, now I really am gonna put that quiche in the oven. You guys ready? Okay, here we go. So remember, 
When we took that bacon out, I set the oven to 425, all right? Now we're just gonna carefully set our beautiful quiche in there, all right? Close the door and at 425, you're looking at about 25 to 30 minutes, okay? So really quickly, y'all are gonna have to bear with me. I've gotta clear this or like my brain might explode, right? So one thing you can always be doing in your kitchen is clearing. It's always nice to have that nice big stove because then everything, mm -hmm. all right, perfect. And we're back. Golly, I wish I moved that fast in my own kitchen. All right, so here's where we're at, right? We've got our candied bacon out of the oven. It's ready to go, all right? If you're doing this ahead, you can set it aside, try your best not to eat it, um, and you're good, right? We've got our quiche baking. The last thing we're gonna do is make the components of our grapefruit thyme mimosa. So first thing first, we are gonna make, whoops, wrong burner. We are gonna make a thyme simple syrup. And believe me, it's not called simple syrup for nothing, right? So I'm gonna use a one-to-one -one ratio. So I have one cup of water. I have one cup of sugar. Woo! All right, I'm gonna bring this to a boil and I'm just gonna take a little spoon, right? So this is kind of all I'm really looking to happen here is I'm waiting for the sugar to dissolve. I'm waiting for a little simmer. And then, I mean, as it's coming up, I'm gonna add some fresh thyme. I love thyme. I feel like you can never have enough thyme, right? Um, anyway, I do love thyme. It's a great herb. It really plays nicely with grapefruit. However, uh, if you're a rosemary person, and I know a lot of folks have rosemary out in their gardens, feel free to take a couple of sprigs of rosemary as well. It'll totally work with this. And frankly, like simple syrups anyway are such an easy thing that you can do. It's great to have these in your refrigerator. They make for incredible cocktails um, and really, you can infuse just about anything into these. Um, for example, you could make like a chili spiced uh, simple syrup that has like some nice heat. I'm just gonna kind of wait for this. Uh, chilies, you could throw chilies in here and get a simple syrup that has like a little heat on the back end. You could do warm spices like cinnamon sticks, um, star anise, uh, cloves. Sometimes I'll take thinly sliced fresh ginger and throw it in there. Um, any herb works as well. So you have all these options for creating the simple syrup. And once you've finished making it, all you're gonna do is let it kind of hang out 10, 15 minutes, let it steep just like you would uh, hot tea, uh, and then strain it. And that simple syrup can live in your fridge easy a couple weeks. I'm like confession, I've had it sometimes for a month. At the end of the day, it is basically sugar. So it's kind of a preservative. All right, I'm gonna give this a stir. I mean, you can kind of see at this point, sugar's still kind of, you know, not quite there, right? It's still like not quite dissolved, but we're getting closer. All right, so I'm kind of stirring. I am a big fan of um, really any, any brunchy cocktail, but I do love a good mimosa. And really the reason is I am a fan of bubbles, right? Bubbles kind of make my life happy. I think there really doesn't need to be a special occasion. I know I have a lot of folks associate uh, bubbles with like celebrating, like it needs to be a big occasion, wrong. You can have bubbles and celebrate anytime. For mimosas, this is not the place I would necessarily splurge on a super expensive bottle of champagne. For me, I tend to find like a cava, which is basically a champagne in Spain, or a prosecco, which is basically like a sparkling wine in Italy, or even a sparkling wine out of California. You can get some great deals on those bottles and you, you just don't need a $50 bottle of champagne to make a great mimosa cocktail. All right, I can see that I'm starting to get some little bubbles in here. Almost all my sugar has dissolved. Again, I'm just really trying to bring it up to a simmer. And as soon as I get that nice simmer, in fact, I'm just gonna go ahead, throw that thyme in there. Give it a little, little pop. I'm gonna wait for a boil. I'll turn it off and then let it go. So we're super close. See all those bubbles kind of starting to come around the uh, rim. 
for me, I mean, we're really, really about there. Sometimes I get a little impatient, right? I think we're good. So I'm turning it off. I'm going to set it here and I'm going to let this rest. And as it steeps, that's what's going to infuse that thyme flavor into that simple syrup. All right. Look at these beauties, right? I've got two massive uh, grapefruit. And today, I'm going to cut it. I'm hoping I I've got ruby reds. Um, I didn't get ruby reds. That's all right. It's still going to be delicious. But I will say, if you can find those really gorgeous Texas ruby reds, you're going to have that beautiful color, right? So all I need to do at this point, squeeze these suckers and get some fresh juice. Now, woo, and splash some people. I'm just kind of going over this. You know, if you have a citrus reamer at the house, you can use it. Sometimes for me, grapefruit can be a little bit uh, cumbersome trying to use a citrus reamer. And I feel like a lot of times I just kind of end up you know, creating a big old mess and a lot of uh, a lot of pulp gets in there or like some big segments, but this is great. All right, squeeze another sucker. Here we go. Now, another thing. You may tell me, Melissa, I am not, I mean, can I just use a really good grapefruit juice that I find at the store? Sure, of course you can. I mean, for this, use something like a higher quality grapefruit juice, something like fresh squeezed if you can find it. But yeah, of course, no one's in your house judging you. So you just follow your bliss. For me, that looks pretty good. I mean, how many mimosas am I really gonna drink, right? But while I'm here, just to make it fun and pretty, I think I'm gonna cut a little thin slice, right? Make a little quarter. I'm gonna just stick a little slice in there. And now we'll have a really pretty little garnish just to go on our drink, right? All right, so I've got my grapefruit juice. I've got my simple syrup. I've got a little garnish. We are really getting close here now. So let's say you're doing ahead, right? Once this is steeped for about 10 minutes, what you're gonna do is strain it and throw it in your fridge because you want this nice and cold. You don't want a super hot liquid going in with your nice cold bubbles, right? So today, let's say you're like, I cannot wait and we are having this brunch and we are having this cocktail today. What you can do to cool this down is create a quick ice bath. And this is a great way for cooling down any liquids that you need to get to like a refrigerated temperature quickly. So what you're gonna need is two bowls. One bowl needs to be slightly larger than the other. Okay, here we go. Okay, I got my little bowl, I got my big bowl, all right? And all I'm gonna do, I, I really want one of these in my house. Just pack this, a little bit of ice, all right? At normally at home, if I had bigger ice cubes, I might add a little bit of water here, but these are so little, it's gonna melt pretty quick. So, whoop, I have got, I've got my bowl and my bowl of ice. I'm gonna just really quickly pour this in. All right, I'm just using a fork to hold those thyme sprigs out. And I tell you what, if you get a couple little sprigs or a couple little leaves in there, no biggie. All right, and then we're literally just using a spoon to move this liquid around and the ice underneath it is gonna come in contact with the bowl above it. You definitely wanna use stainless steel here. Probably should have mentioned that. And it's just gonna quickly cool things down. And seriously, y'all, if you've made this, I mean, I don't know if you're getting it, but I already get this really bold thyme flavor already. All right, and like, that's really about it. You can feel underneath that your ice is melting a little. I'm just gonna cool it down. And this is about here. So at this point, we're really just coming down to the big finish, which is waiting on that quiche. So at this point, just really quickly, if you are uh, at home cooking along, let's go check that quiche real quick, right? All right, so I'm gonna walk over here. Got my handy towel. Oh, we are getting close, all right? So see how this is getting nice and golden brown? Still a little wiggly. I might give this like five more minutes, which actually, 
Five more minutes is perfect because it's gonna give us just enough time to make a quick cocktail and we'll be ready to go. All right, so I'm gonna grab a couple of flutes. I'm gonna grab a bottle of Prosecco and we're gonna make our delightful mimosa. Okay, all right, so we've got our flutes. Woo! Here's that bottle of Prosecco. We're gonna make this really quickly. Just looking for that tab. All right, so popping open. So I have to tell you, there is like a part of me that like super wants to like pop the top and uh, make the big poof noise. But two things. One, I don't wanna break things in the Golden Fork demo kitchen. If you're at home, pop away. And two, I have to say, when I used to do fine dining, like in front of house, it was like a big no-no. You were not allowed. So what you're supposed to do, is open it and it's supposed to sound, if I remember quite, like an angel sighing. So it's just like, ah, right? So we're gonna do an angel sigh. And all that's gonna do, just twist and tap, you're gonna angle it to the side, slow, and you can feel it kind of starting to come. Mm, I'm like nervous, it's gonna come out wrong. Here we go. Ooh, I can feel it, so much suspense. Ah. All right, I feel like, um, thank you, Dimitri. He was like my front of house guy. All right, so here we go. I gotta say, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to pour this simple syrup out of a bowl and hit it just right. So I'm gonna give myself a little. And look, this is all kind of to taste, right? So I like things not too sweet, so I'm just gonna add just a touch, right? Oop. This is probably like a half ounce, all right? Then some of our freshly squeezed grapefruit juice. All right. I mean, keep it. I tend to go like about a third of my mixer and then two thirds of the good stuff. So last but not least, here we go. So don't go too nuts. I normally try and pour it to about right there. Let it fizz a little and finish it the rest of the way. And for the most part, I've managed to avoid you know, making too big a mess. All right, and my guess is at this point, that quiche is ready to roll. So let's go get her. All right, oh, it smells, yes! That is what I'm looking for. So nice, deep, golden brown, Oh. If y'all do not have this ready at your house, holy moly, it smells so good. That is kind of heavy too. You may want to have an extra napkin ready. I'm just going to set him right here. All right. So let's get a look. I am going to close that. Ooh. All right. I'm going to bring this in close. Let me see. All right. So. For those of you at home, holy moly, right? I mean, you can see it's like set, right? It jiggles, it's good. You want a little jiggle. Uh, that color, that kind of deep golden brown, that is gonna be some like amazing cheesy goodness, right? See, everything's kind of in there, ready to go. So for me, I'm gonna be honest, typically kind of like a lasagna. I'll let this set maybe five minutes or so, five to 10, just let it cool and set slightly, and then you are ready to roll. I mean, y'all, check this out, right? We've got our incredible quiche. Again, give it like five to 10 minutes just to kind of set up as soon as it gets out of the oven. It's gonna be perfect. We've got our candied bacon. If you've been good enough not to eat it yet, you should have quite a bit here, right? And of course, our grapefruit mimosa. So, now you have your official Prize Fest 2020 brunch. And here's the thing, guys. We are just getting started with Prize Fest. We've got Josh Harmon doing his cook along tonight for Food Prize, Josh Bonet on Thursday, got Tristan Epps coming here on Saturday of next week. You've got 
a whole week to get all that film watching in. Don't forget about Fashion Prize on Friday night, Music Prize next Saturday. I mean, we are just getting started and this is the fuel you're gonna need. It's gonna be amazing and you can just nibble all week if you haven't eaten it already. All right, with that, you have your official Prize Fest brunch. Do it at your leisure. I mean, and I'm gonna here to tell you, this even microwaves easy. So you can rewarm your bacon, Throw that in the microwave. You got brunch for days, really, if you play your cards right. And with that, I don't think there's anything else to say except Viva La Prize Fest! I'll see you guys at HQ soon, and I'm bringing that bacon.